Anyone in the workforce today knows that the workplace has been transformed over the past decade or so, reacting to technology, economic fundamentals, and increasingly a generational shift. Millennials, in sheer numbers, now make up the largest cohort in the workforce, and they are bringing with them their own distinctive sensibilities. Joining us now to examine the work life of the up-and-coming generation, we welcome Lucas Pesa. He is a millennial and business consultant. Noor Malik, millennial and account manager and part-time entrepreneur. Yakov Sluchenkov, millennial, human resources executive and member of the board of directors at the Ontario Municipal Human Resources Association. And Rafael Gomez, director of the Center for Industrial Relations at the University of Toronto. And we're delighted to welcome, let me think, one, two, three millennials? You don't present millennial. No, no. You, it's, uh, you look way too mature. That's right. But uh, you are. Yes, I think I am actually getting younger uh, as the show is going on. So <laughs> I'm hoping that there, I'm not going to be an infant by the end of the show. Uh, me too, me too. And one university professor who is not a millennial, no. but who knows all about this. Anyway, right. great to have you all here. Can we start this off with this observation about millennials from the CEO of an American search company? And Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this quote up. This is from Fortune.com. In my experience, perks are often doled out in order to keep millennials who are constantly changing jobs around longer. But if those millennials aren't tied to core values, they'll leave. It doesn't matter if you have lunch brought in on Fridays. People, especially millennials, are looking for a blend of behaviors, beliefs, and values that groups of people share. They're looking for a job that does more than just pay the bills. They want a team. They want a company that is contributing something to make the world a better place. They want collaboration. Setting up a big TV that Air Sports Center can't offer this. It must come from the type of culture that you, the entrepreneur, set forth to build. Okay, Noor, you're one of the people allegedly described in that comment. How well does this describe you? I think it's very accurate, actually, because I think as a millennial in the workforce today, I find that I spend so much of my time in the workforce, so much of my day is spent at an organization. I want to make sure that that contribution in my day is going towards an organization that shares the same beliefs and values as me. I want to feel that the amount of time that I've spent working at this company has been productive in a way and not just in matter of like filling out a timesheet or spending a certain number of hours per day at a certain place. Lucas, making the world a better place, that was part of that quote. How true is that for you and other millennials you know? Well, I think the level of social consciousness is true in a sense, but not necessarily because millennials have the moral high ground all the time. I think that with the sometimes overexposure of information that millennials have access to, especially in the way in which that social media has changed the world in the last 10 years even, there's more access to information, which means there's more awareness of a lot of the trends that are happening that millennials may agree with or disagree with, not just millennials, but all generations. So the fact that there is a higher level of awareness, I think, spurs on a greater sense of willingness to speak out or make change, whether that's because we are in agreement of what we're seeing or not. But I think the higher level of awareness is the source of that. Team collaboration, a big deal for you guys? I believe so, yeah. But, but again, even I, I think that's, that transfers across all generations. But the, the, the core thing of having a team that's willing to support you is that not only do you develop special relationships that help you feel comfortable and move forward in your career, but it allows for a better work culture that can create a better product because people feel more comfortable in their workspace and more confident in their ability to make decisions, which helps them make things and, and carry out projects that are beneficial to the company they work for. Yakov, there was also a reference in that comment to millennials changing jobs constantly. There was one study that showed 60% of millennials leave companies within three years. What do you think that says about them? Uh, I, I do mean to to uh, what says about millennials or about yeah, the employers? About millennials. Um, I, I think uh, it doesn't say as much about millennials as people would like it to say. I think it says a lot about the employers that these millennials are employed by. I, I think there is a, sort of this characterization of millennials to be these these job hoppers, uh, uh, and and the narrative that's being constructed by employers and and by people who speak to the topic frequently by generation uh, baby boomers and generation X about millennials as opposed to millennials themselves. That that when you look at the the issues that are facing millennials, that you can actually very clearly explain the reason that these job movements are happening. So so just from a from a decision matrix perspective. Uh, Manpower Group does, does a large study, the results come out this year, looking at 19,000 millennials. 
and uh, about 2,500 hiring managers that would be looking at these millennials. And they actually ask millennials what millennials are after in the workplace environment and what's motivating them to leave, uh, which, is, which is, sounds, like a, sounds like a fantastic idea. Why not ask millennials <laughs> about what, what millennials... What That's right. Yeah. Uh, let's ask them, uh, as, as opposed to sort of putting them in the room over there and let's talk about them in third person. So they ask the, the millennials sort of what are the considerations that they have when they're, when they're selecting employers and what are their priorities. Because intuitively and from the talking points, we would think it's, it's the fle flexibility, it's the, the gym or the, you know, I could get a haircut in my office. It's not those things? No, it's not those things. Um, and and I, I don't think you can do much with my hair, quite honestly, except what, <laughs> what's, what's sitting in front of you right now. Uh, number one, 92% money. Okay. The respondents in the study say 92% they'd like money, and 87% they'd like job security. And so, so when asking the millennials, you're sort of faced with this paradigm of how do you deal with this perpetual narrative uh, that the employers are buying into, where when you ask the millennials, they're actually after job security. Hmm. And, and, and the, 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 I think the truth is, is, what does job security mean to millennials? And, and job security frequently means employability. And it's when uh, employers, uh, in treating their millennials, uh, don't realize that desire to be challenged, that desire to be new things, that they're essentially cornering millennials into this position where the millennial is concerned about their employability in the future. They've mm -hmm. gone through the Great Recession. They know what that looks like. They know what their older generations have been through when, when times get tough. And it's very important for them that they continue to be marketable to, to everybody in the workplace. And when they feel that their employer is not doing a good job of that, they will leave that employer. Interesting. Now, here's an observation from somebody on Facebook who had the following to say, following up on that. For me, the fascinating aspect of interviewing millennials is discovering how refreshingly different these kids are from my generation, which is Generation X. They practically have no interest in material consumption or ownership. They want to love fully, travel lots, work with purpose and passion. They live simply and minimally. Okay, Raphael, that goes against everything I just heard over here. So what am I supposed to believe? Well, you can always square a circle, as they say in Britain. And Do try. I, yeah, Yakov, who was taught by one of the greatest professors in this generation. W would he be at this table? Myself, uh, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yakov and his millennial colleagues have actually said everything that is uh, compatible with what you've just pointed out. Which, again, you, know, you, you can draw observations from a few conversations, which is the Facebook quote, mm -hmm. and as opposed to a large-scale kind of investigation in which you ask questions and you determine patterns. So more patterns. his answer. I think so, but you can square with what was said there. That there, there is truth in the fact that what Yakov's saying is people have always moved jobs uh, when they've been younger. There's a standard labor market theory behind it. You're searching for the right match in the, in the labor market. You search. The first job you have, if you're lucky enough, to find the passion mm -hmm. in that career and the employer who's willing to give you a long-term career path, job security, and also the challenge of learning something new, as soon as that stops, you will leave. And th there's always been much more job turnover for younger workers. For, th for that reason and others, you're not tied, you your exit costs are lower, you're not tied to a mortgage yet, you, you have the freedom to find a new job, test out a new job that's maybe paying you more. What's happened is the, the frequency in which job changes happen seems to be a bit higher amongst this generation. And another fact, which speaks to Yakov's point about the desire for job security. Well, um, it turns out that uh, the non-standard job, we'll say it's not full-time, it's not um, a permanent job, so think of temporary part-time work. The one age group where that has really increased has been the 25-year-olds, 15 to 25-year-olds, much higher than it was two decades ago. And, and it's lasting longer. So if you look at a 30-year-old today, the edge of the millennials that we have here, they're also more likely to be in these non-standard jobs, much more likely than they were uh, 10 years ago, say, the labor force data that we have. So those are indications that, yes, although they might be less materially acquisitive in the area of consumption, that's where you can square the circle, mm -hmm. that's true, but the technology has allowed them to be. They don't need to have huge compilations of LPs at home, although some collect them for those purposes, but mm -hmm. the technology has led, that led them to be less acquisitive in that sense but the desire for a well-paying job that's secure in some sense, in the sense that it, you're allowed to be employable, if what you're learning is continually raising your game and improving your potential productivity and your signal to employers. If you're stuck in a ghetto inside the organization not doing anything 
interesting that you can put on a resume for a future job, then a millennial like any worker, knowing what's down the road, would jump. Might get out. Noor, let me follow up with you then. Uh, money and job security, how important are those two things to you? Money vary. Um, I think in the nature of the world that we live in, the world that the millennials kind of inherited, things have gotten way more expensive. I was looking at some statistics the other day that the cost of a home in GTA in 2006 was about 350000 and as of 2016, it's $1.3 million. Yeah. And I think that $1 million increase is significant enough that people in my generation look at home ownership as a very far-fetched dream. So when we look at the place where we want to work, income is definitely something that's a huge driver for us. You expect to ever to own a, own a home in your life? Honestly, no. Really? Yeah. That dream is just off the table for you? For multiple reasons. One, which is, I don't know what the value is of staying tied down to one specific location. I think people in my generation are more willing to move borders and try out living in different places in the world. Hmm. And home ownership kind of restricts that. Ties you down too much. It does. Hmm. Okay. Lucas, how about this? Millennials spend 18 hours a day consuming media. Uh, that's one of the things that comes out of one of these studies. Much of this generation, digital natives as opposed to digital immigrants, which is what I guess I am. What's the impact of that on your workplace? Well, the main thing to keep in mind in terms of the, is how many avenues there are available now to acquire information. Hmm. Um, especially, as we were saying before, within the last 10 years, Media consumption has gone from strictly newspapers, television, to now, uh, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, there's a number of different online forums that people can use to acquire information now. Mm -hmm. So the way in which it impacts the workforce now is that people have a bit more um, transparency in terms of in what they know that they can achieve. So if, for example, in a flat hierarchical um, organization, companies are operating differently now in the sense that in a big transnational corporation, you may have, uh, for example, multiple marketing departments that serve different industries depending on what business the company is in, for example. So having access to information, and in especially in the way in which social media is, has come about, it's created a sense of connectivity and has allowed people to access information in much greater spades than ever before. How about connectivity to your older colleagues? If you're a digital native, yep. you're presumably more tech savvy than they are. Does that create a gulf between you and them? I don't, not necessarily because, well, number one, it allows the younger generation to provide assistance to their managers or their, their supervisors, whoever it is. So that allows for an opportunity to create a connection and establish a good relationship. But one of the things that I think social media and online connectivity has really done is it's created an expectation among an entire generation that if there's a sense of, if there's some information that we need to acquire, it's readily accessible for us. Mm -hmm. So having that connectivity in the workplace, and not necessarily having online access to information in the workplace, but having access to um, direct access to your manager, so you have the ability to understand where you are in your career and your development and your progress, those sorts of things have, I believe, come from the connectivity that we've experienced as an online generation, so to speak. So companies that are able to provide that connectivity and availability to whether it's allowing people to understand where they stand in their performance or how well they're progressing in their careers, I think in one way or another it all comes back to the idea of connectivity that's been created by the online world. Nor the other thing we hear about your generation, and you'll tell me if this is true or just a stereotype, is that you need a kind of, this is a bit of a pejorative way to put it, but work with me here. You need a kind of an emotional coddling that previous generations didn't need. So you need frequent evaluations during the course of the year, not just sort of an annual evaluation on how you're doing. True or false? Well, I don't want to speak for the entire yes, millennial we're, population Yes, we're, we're here, making you do that. You're, you're, <laughs> you speak for every single person in the world. Well, who is... on record, I will, I will say that I don't know if I necessarily agree with calling it coddling. I think reviews and feedbacks are very important, especially when you're a young professional that's entered the workforce. It's your first time having a full-time career. Maybe it's your second or third job, but you need to be aware of if you're, what you're doing is actually aligned with what the organization wants and what their expectation is of you. Annual reviews, I think, limit the ability of an employee to gauge how they're performing in context of the entire organization. So I am one of those people that would expect to have a review more frequently than once a year because I do think things in an organization change so much in a year that an annual review doesn't necessarily effectively capture everything that you need to be aware of when you're starting out in your career, whereas let's say it's a quarterly review, you're at least able to manage how you're performing and align and adjust that according to what the organization expects of you. If this is a generation, however, Professor, that has been 
raised by their parents to believe that the sun, the star, mm -hmm. and stars and the moon rise and set on them, why would they want to put themselves up for hearing potentially negative comments multiple times throughout the course of the year? Well, here's where we have to dispel the myths surrounding millennials. Okay. Um, I'll answer it, but I'll answer your question in a sec. The tendency to review a younger colleague has always been there. And, you, and again, looking back, you have to dispel the cohort effect, i.e. the millennial effect, from just an age or life cycle effect. Mm -hmm. When you're younger, you need to supervise more. You need to give feedback more. And any enlightened company that follows maybe its standard HR practices would do that. And you have the consummate rise. What is the cohort effect has been the sophistication and growth and emergence of performance management and HR that's permeated every organization. So they're kind of twinned with the age effect, which has always been there. You used to have more supervisors watching you, mm -hmm. distinguishing it from this performance and feedback, constructive development, shall we say. And secondly, the per pervasive nature now of performance management that's intruded into almost every organization, public sector and private. Sure. So they're the first generation that's felt both of those things twin. And I'll just end with like uh, one observation, that is that um, the generation that is so-called coddled. Um, uh, maybe you don't you like that word. Nobody well, likes no. that word. I mean, but there's, there's one underlying truth in that you know, parents have spent more time with this generation than the previous. I think there was a doubling of mother time spent. This was a study done across 13 OECD countries from the 1960s to today. And there was a doubling of, of, of overall parental time, but a tripling of, of father time with their children. So this is like across uh, most OECD countries, and it happened over the last 40 years. So parents have spent more time with their children. In that sense, you might think, well, this is carried over into the um, workplace. But I think that workplace uh, connection has more to do with the spread of HR, spread of performance management, and the fact that young people have always been uh, looked upon a little more closely by an employer. Yakov, let me put this to you, which is that millennials expect their opinions to be heard and respected. And I just want to, I guess, uh, in setting up this question, make the comparison that when I was your age, I neither uh, expected uh, my opinion to be heard and respected, uh, or no, mm -hmm. let me rephrase that. My opinions were never heard or respected, <laughs> yeah. and I don't think I was different from anybody else uh, at the time. We just sort of expected to be kind of, you know, low person on the hierarchy chart, and you'd be treated accordingly. Why do millennials feel they're entitled to different treatment today? I don't think millennials are uh, of that view. Um, and, and just to, to, to touch on the previous point uh, about performance appraisals uh, uh, and how it connects, I think, to your question here, is, is the value of, of conversation and the value of mentorship and the value of relating to your coworkers and to your supervisors. Uh, one of the takeaways that people have from a conversation like we just uh, had with the professor and, and newer is about performance appraisals and the frequency. So what happens is instead of annual ones, we start having quarterly ones. Why don't we mean on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis and fill out a 10-page document? <laughs> uh, that is completely the wrong attitude. The key here is conversations with your peers and conversations with your supervisors. So where organizations again go wrong with this is they try to say we need more performance appraisals, we need more documents, we need more, more documentation. Where you actually need to talk to your employees. Once again, we're talking about novel ideas. Uh, why don't you find out and let your subordinates, and, and frequently they happen to be younger subordinates, how they're doing. And I can assure you that even uh, subordinates from other generations will, will feel value that verbal conversation. I've been in organizations where for three, four years I did not get a written documentation, but at no point was I confused as to where I was sitting with the organization because I spoke to my supervisor on a weekly basis and I received that immediate feedback. I just, I just want to shut, shut that part of it out because <laughs> it, it's quite dangerous when you talk about performance appraisals from a, we got to ramp it up because millennials really want more of them. Millennials just want to know that, that feedback, how they're doing just like. More, more just informal like, feedback as opposed to bureaucratizing but, but, it. But, that, that's right. But yeah. the problem is firms superimpose the performance management yeah. uh, approach over this dialogue and voice that's mm -hmm. sort of more uh, emphasized by the traditional theories of the employment relationship where you give voice to workers and you get commensurate loyalty and buy-in and, and better performance at the end. Mm -hmm. but not, not just performance though, I think as the thing is some managers aren't, the, the process of actually giving feedback to somebody is nerve-wracking for some managers. It's not always a comfortable situation to sit down with somebody and break down what they've done right or wrong. So just to, to build on your point a little bit, 
frequent check-ins, it's not always just for the betterment of the person that you're talking to. If you have a frequent enough dialogue with your employee, it makes it easier on the manager as well because it allows not only for a more transparent dialogue, but managers who may not be as comfortable sitting down and being in that situation where they're forced to critique somebody, it gives them more of an opportunity to practice that particular craft, and it makes it easier on them, which opens up more of a dialogue and can ultimately help the performance of the employee base. Nor, let me pull another quote out of uh, what we have been discussing so far. Millennials expect to be able to make an impact on the workplace. How true is that? Very true. I think as a generation that's young, as young people tend to be very active and energetic and they feel like they can make a change in the world and improve things for the better, I think your expectation of the organization is that you come in and sometimes you challenge conventional thinking. Maybe you have an idea that's better than the way that the company's done it for a couple of years or a couple of decades and I think there's an expectation millennials have that at least you're heard, even if the idea is not necessarily executed upon, at least there's a culture where if I have a good idea, I should feel comfortable enough to bring it forward because I want to improve the environment that I work in. Do you do that? I do, absolutely. How's it received? I think, well, in some instances, obviously, when you have organizations that have existed for a very long time, there tends to be a culture where this is the status quo and this is how we've always done it, so this is how we're always going to do it. But I think you chip away at it bit by bit, and if you make a strong case, very progressive organizations are out there and they're very willing to listen to employees, and I've been in those kinds of situations where my voice has been heard. Yeah. Do you run into situations where uh, a manager or a superior at your company will simply say something like, look, we've done it this way for a long time, it's worked very well, you're 27 years old or 30 or whatever, uh, just sort of you know, put your head down and get, go along to get along, and, and just sort of shut up. <laughs> Do you get that? Yeah, I, I think I think you get that, and I and I, I don't mean to project myself, like Noor said, on behalf of all millennials <laughs> everywhere. Uh, but I think that is an interaction that happens very frequently, and that now we connect to uh, millennials are very happy in receiving that feedback and then taking that away and doing a little brainstorming as to what that means for us, and that connects to your job hopping. So whereas perhaps in previous generations there was a more of a, nah, shucks, I guess that's the way it is. I'll come in tomorrow and hope it'll change. Uh, uh, millennials and, and their skill set frequently have very good self-awareness surrounding what they're worth to the marketplace mm -hmm. and that their marketplace is more than happy to receive them. So if that's the feedback that they're receiving from their immediate supervisor and their immediate organization, and they say, you know, the, the same goes people leave uh, managers. They don't leave them employers. Mm -hmm. And so if, if that relationship is, is not there, you're more than happy to, to do some job hopping. The, the IBM uh, Institute for, for Business Value uh, did research looking at uh, the, the desire to build um, um, consensus in decision making. And it looked at millennials and it looked like Generation X. So right now Generation X would be anywhere from 36, 37 years of age to about 49. And they looked at baby boomers. And it may not surprise you, and your kind of in your original articulation of how you see it, uh, that baby boomers are not as interested in building consensus with their teams. Um, they're kind of here's the way it's going to be and kind of deal with it. Uh, now, what you may be surprised to know is that millennials are not the ones who want to seek and and get consensus from the team. It's actually Generation X. It's actually the people who are 37 to 49, frequently your middle to senior manager level individuals who are obsessed with the consensus building. <laughs> and, and I can tell you, once again, speaking from my own perspective, it gets quite nauseating from a millennial. Everybody assuming that you want to weigh in because you then end up weighing in on a whole bunch of ridiculous stuff you don't need to be weighing in. Hmm. Um, uh, you know, I, I've been through sort of a, a bargaining process where at the end of the bargaining process, we're getting into the nitty gritty of you know, winter jackets for an organization. And literally, I got an email asking me what color the, the jacket should be that, that our employees are going to be wearing outside. I appreciate the feedback that that's solicited for me, but that's not my expertise. There's, there's, I have other stuff to do. Other millennials have other work to Bigger do. Bigger fish to fry that's is right, the expression. That's right. Yeah. Um, got so it. OK, of, that's good to know. Uh, Lucas, let's do this. According to the Conference Board of Canada, more than 70% of full-time workers age 18 to 29, so millennials, would be more satisfied in their jobs if they could work remotely using cloud software. Does that ring true with you? Um, not necessarily. I don't believe that giving somebody a chance to work remotely is always 
as beneficial. Like me, for example, I like to be in the office because I find that I'm able to work better when I'm actually around my coworkers because it allows for better transfer of thought. Mm -hmm. What I think that companies are trying to achieve, and in a lot of cases, I think they're very successful in doing this, is they give the option for remote work, especially, as a way of reaching out to their employees and letting their employees know that they are understood. Because people, in, in terms of the way they live their lives, people have their own set of circumstances. People have families. They have a number of different things outside of work that they have to deal with on a daily basis. And I think something that's very invaluable that companies are trying to achieve is giving people the option of allowing them to achieve all, all the things they need to achieve in their daily lives, whether it's you know taking care of their kids or, or whatever it may be, while still being able to do their work without having to be physically away from their other obligations. So uh, I think m in terms of allowing people to work remotely, I don't necessarily, it works for everybody. So I don't necessarily think that's the point of it. I think what it speaks to more so is the desire for companies to let people know that they are understood. Because if an employee feels understood, mm -hmm then typically they'll have more confidence in the organization they work for, and that'll allow them to feel more confident in their work, more comfortable in their organization, and ultimately I think that produces a better product. I get you. Rafael, though, the, uh, this sounds like this kind of question speaks to, again, it may be a stereotype that we have, that millennials are more comfortable interacting with their screens one-on-one -on -one, mm -hmm. as opposed to dealing with actual people in bigger groups. Again, from your experience, does that ring true? Uh, well, I'll speak from my experience and then draw on facts and evidence. Uh, the experience that we I actually like that here. We like facts. We, we like do? evidence. We like evidence. Yeah. Okay. With truthiness, just feels no, right. No, no, not truthiness. <laughs> Truth. We Truth. like that. Yeah. Let's go good. ahead. Um, so, from from the experience that I've seen, uh, students this generation that I've because I've been teaching for a decade and a half, and uh, I've noticed a change, and the change has been actually the one that was just articulated by Lucas. They're more willing to accept any system that you offer them. As long as it's listening to them and there's a flexibility. I'm drawing here on just experience in the classroom and how we uh, provide uh, assignments. And do they all prefer the digital uploads? Not necessarily. Some like to hand it in, come and speak to you. So if you can uh, offer an array of choices to people, uh, this generation seems quite different. And I think the earlier generation, the fr we'll call them on the cusp of not being millennials, but who say, inherit or became uh, conversant with technology, social media, and all these new systems halfway through their adult lives, I think we're more keen to sort of take it on and, and say, we want to use this now 100%. And uh, there's a, there's a, a kind of a, a nice um, differentiation and flexibility in the, in the current generation in terms of acceptance of FaceTime and electronics, mm -hmm. uh, which is different. And, and I, but I find that's translating into all kinds of other areas, too. They're not wedded to one, this is one trait that I've seen personally, They're not wedded to one single um, answer. And that, that cuts across everything in terms of political solutions. The, the one broader perspectives. Yeah, and they can integrate. And they can, you know, this tolerance for ambiguity, mm -hmm. uh, which is a feature of people's personalities. I think this generation has a much higher tolerance for ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And they can square things in their minds that we would find incompatible. Noor, I saw you trying to get in there. Yeah, I think just going back to your earlier point about, let's say, flex time and working from home, I think it's very important as millennials because technology is such a big part of our day that we see that technology is effectively used to help us manage our daily lives. Mm. Speaking from personal experience, my average commute into downtown Toronto for work every day is about three hours. What? My, yep. From where? From, it's North Brampton. So considering all traffic and everything, we're looking at three hours in a day where I'm in my car. Oh, so an hour and a half each way. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Not, yeah. Not <laughs> I thought you meant three hours each way, and no, I no, thought no, that no. even that's a bit above and beyond. Okay. No, so for me, the organization that I work with is very open to working from home, and I find that is quite helpful to me because there's those three hours in a day where I'm stuck in traffic, it's, you're never in a happy mood when you're stuck in traffic. It's never pleasant, especially if there's weather concerns or there's some sort mm. of traffic accident. Hard to be productive as yeah, well. Absolutely. So when I have the ability to work from home, I know that I'm making the most efficiency out of my time. And do, I think, do you miss being with people, though, when you're working at home? Well, yes and no. I think if you're in a connected workplace, you're connecting with your coworkers all the time, whether it's by E via email or through iChat or just calling them on the phone. You're not isolated and working in a bubble. You're still collaborating with them, but you're using technology to help mm -hmm. you do that. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a fine balance between working from home all the time and coming into the office. I think you definitely need both, but it's excellent when an organization is able to provide that flexibility to their employees to have that option. Now, let me, Yakov, you wanted to say. I, I just, the point about learning using digital media, mm -hmm. uh, because 
once again, the stereotype surrounding being obs obsessed with digital media. Uh, I've sort of had the opportunity to speak among, uh, about this topic with, with other employers, and I recall very vividly uh, one time I wasn't sort of the first speaker, but the second speaker to go, and the first speaker said something along the lines of millennials prefer to learn through the internet. They would like to learn through YouTube, they would like to, you, to learn through Facebook. And, and this is very interesting, because when we're talking about learning, and the professor's talking about learning in school, which is very different than, I think, learning in the workplace. So uh, I I another way of putting it, there's a, there's a, if I'm looking, let's say, to, to find out something along the lines of how do I get my cat to you know, stop sitting on my head when I'm sleeping in the middle of the night, I think he's trying to kill me. How do I stop him from getting to do that? I may go on YouTube. Uh, how do I uh, uh, figure out how to insert a furnace filter into my furnace? The air currents are really confusing for me. I'm good with going to YouTube and doing that. The, the IBM Institute for Business Value looks at workplace learning. So the question is posed to millennials, how would you like to learn work-related skills? Not, not the university example, not what the hell is my cat up to. <laughs> and, and the top three ways in which millennials would like to learn. Number one, attending a conference, okay? Where hmm. they're getting information from a speaker, getting to work with their peers. Number two, if that's not available, classroom learning. Okay, again, in a setting with your peers, and number three, and, and we're still not getting to the digital, is with a coworker. Huh. With a coworker learning the skill set. So that we're talking about job shadowing, the old school, you're standing there beside the senior guy and figuring out how to do this. And, and this transition towards webinars. Webinars about this, webinars about that, lectures about this, lectures about that. In the workplace setting, just doesn't align with what millennials actually want in the workplace. And it's exactly the opposite of what most people think. Exactly the opposite. Yeah, interesting. Let's, uh, I want to put another one. Lucas, this one to you. Again, from the original Fortune magazine quote, millennials have no interest in material consumption. I mean, you're pretty nicely dressed. You got a nice watch on. I'm assuming that you don't agree with that. Well, I, I, I would say that millennials, like essentially every generation, there is an element of material desire, no matter who you are, what your background is. But in terms of how it translates to the workplace, one of the things that is very difficult for people breaking into the workforce to deal with is, number one, in certain cases, there are fewer jobs available with more fierce competition. Mm -hmm. uh, a university education now is much more expensive than even 10, 20, 30 years ago. And, and not enough for many of the jobs that your generation wants. Precisely. So to a certain degree, I understand the idea that material motivation is one of the, the factors of working for a living. Mm -hmm. But when you're in the workplace, especially when you're just breaking in and you're, and this kind of goes to what we were talking about before about our uh, heightened sense of awareness because of the access to information that we have, when you're aware of all of these, not necessarily problems, but all of these goings on in terms of the ill affordability of the job market, like Nor was talking about before, or the uh, the expensive uh, nature of, of the post-secondary education. One of the things that is difficult, and this is what I initially was going to say, is when you're in the workforce, you want to know that you're making an impact. Not necessarily, obviously, because you want to make an impact on your organization, but also if you have an awareness that you're progressing in your career, you're moving forward in your within the company, you're developing a good rapport with your coworkers. It gives you a sense of comfort in the sense that you're developing and you're acquiring the knowledge that you need that's later going to allow you to purchase the home or purchase that car or support your family in whatever way you need to. So as much as material possessions and material motivation is a part of not just the workplace but everyday life, I think that the non-measurable sort of way of establishing relationships and the in the sort of non-material components of working within a company and developing relationships and moving forward in your careers, I would say that is more valuable than strictly the materialistic sense. I've got a minute left here, and uh, Noor, I want to give it to you. Uh, I think it's fair to say a lot of people in my generation live to work. Does your generation work to live? Again, I think it's, it varies amongst people, mm -hmm. like the generation of millennials. I'm sure there's varied opinions amongst everybody, but I think work to live is the motto because when you realize you've got 24 hours in a day, you have to spend some of it at work. There are things outside of a person's place of employment that is their motivation in life. It's their reason in life. And I think 
when you have an employee who is productive and happy, it's an employee who has other things to do beyond just work. When you're, a lot of millennials open up their own businesses on the side because they find they don't often get that same level of control in their organization or they have certain passions and talents that they just can't pursue necessarily for a living full time. And so very often it's like, yes, you have your nine to five, but then there's also a five to nine that keeps you going in other ways. Hmm. Sounds like in terms of work-life balance, we may have a lot to learn from you. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> Could be. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming in for this discussion today. Uh, Yakov Sluchenkov, Human Resources Executive. Lucas Pesa, Business Consultant. Noor Malik, Account Manager, Part-Time Entrepreneur. Rafael Gomez, Director, Center for Industrial Relations, U of T. Great to have you all at uh, TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.